Well, what a treat it is to be here, Mrs. Bush. So good to see you. And Mrs. Collins, an old, old friend, Dee Collins, from many years in Washington. Uh, and these two women are out of a great tradition of, um, of the women who come as the <laughs> adjuncts, a really dumb turn, uh, to the men who make them often make trouble and the women make it better. <laughs> uh, and the, um, and the, um, the, the ad that Anita read, I was thinking at the end where it says United States is an equal opportunity employer, actually not until a guy has to do all of those things. <laughs> and and then, then we'll see how it goes. But um, the truth is, is that people are really so ignorant about the roles of first ladies and the jobs that first ladies have done throughout our history. So our little panel here is uh, designed to try to uh, shed some light and, and uh, reduce some of that degree of ignorance because there's an idea, and Alita is a, an expert on Eleanor Roosevelt, and there's this sense that before Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, first mm -hmm. ladies were sen sitting around tending to the tatting, you know, um, exactly. pouring tea. And, um, uh, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, and, um, and even since Eleanor Roosevelt, there's a, a sense of not really being clear on who was doing what. And, um, and so, um, and, and Mrs. Bush, you always complain that when, when your husband was elected, people said to you, are you going to be Barbara Bush or Hillary Clinton? And, you know, yeah. I'd like to be Laura Bush, and, uh, which, of course, you are and have been wonderfully. But, um, you know, there's always that, that thing that goes on, too. In fact, I... Um, I read that Bess Truman at one point realized coming in after Eleanor Roosevelt, she said, I feel like Elizabeth Monroe coming in after Dolly Madison, um, which uh, was you know, very historically accurate for her in a lot of ways. But um, uh, Kat, Kat, you don't mind if I call you your nickname. No, absolutely. Um, the, you and I have both written about, you've written a much more at length, that period of the, of the founding. And... Um, you know, Martha Washington, we know, was active politically and in terms of policy. Uh, you know, lobbying for the veterans' benefits for the Revolutionary War veterans she had been to camp with for the eight long years of the Revolution. And Abigail Adams probably gives, is the rule breaker in terms of bringing civility. She was kind of causing troubles of her own. Um, but Dolly Madison, Dolly Madison was really... Uh, a figure in American politics that people don't have a really good sense of. Yes, and I have to say something nice about Martha Washington. Um, <laughs> it's easy to do. I liked Martha. She's a very nice <laughs> yeah. lady. I, I Mary think... Washington, not so much. But, uh, <laughs> I think she wouldn't disagree if we sort of mentioned that she didn't have a taste for the role, right? So she said she at some point felt like a prisoner. Chief state prisoner. State prisoner. But she acknowledged right away that, that, that there was something going on, that she understood that the American experiment was more than just politics mm -hmm. or politics in a different way. So she began right away, even though she didn't care for it, would rather be at home at Mount Vernon, uh, she began wondering about protocol and in her own way began to establish different protocols. Because the founders understood it's not enough to have a constitution and a set of laws. We needed to remake life, life in an American way. And the ladies of that class talked about a forming what they called an American manners. And by manners, they didn't just mean uh, teacups and what fork to use, but a way of being and a way of treating each other. So she went some way toward that. As you um, possibly ungraciously pointed out, Abigail Adams, not so much. <laughs> uh, she was much more of a traditional, uh, a more like a, almost like a, a political partner to her husband. She was interested in ideas and politics. So it's not until Love Dolly the Madison. Love and sedition law. Oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sadly, sadly, uh, well, we can, we can uh, point to her influence in policy <laughs> and sedition laws. Um, but it's not really till Dolly Madison comes to, uh, to Washington in 1801 as the wife of James Madison, Secretary of State, that we begin to see a real political animal as first lady. She did have a taste for the job. And she establishes so many things that we now associate with the First Lady, being the commander, if you will, of what we call the unofficial sphere of politics, the social sphere. 
the connection to the White House, the sort of role as the charismatic figure. And I must say, um, I sympathize with everybody who followed her because everybody felt that onus of being like Dolly Madison. She just set so much up in place. And, and essentially remained First Lady even after her successors came in. She ruled over Washington for decades. Yes. I was first drawn to, to Dolly Madison because she was so famous. <laughs> and I didn't really understand that because I grew up in Philadelphia, so Dolly Madison ice cream. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I watched those Charlie Brown Christmas specials, Dolly Madison Cakes and Pies, and then went I back. I actually made a Dolly Madison cake on the Martha Stewart show. <laughs> and, and, and Martha Stewart kept slapping my hand because I kept wanting to talk instead of making the cake. You, know? <laughs> Hookie, you have the most varied career. Yes. Um, <laughs> I cannot cop to baking anything, let me just say that right now. Um, but I wondered about this fame and then to discover indeed that by the end of her life, and we actually have photographs of her because she lived long enough to be photographed, that she became this icon, this relic of the Republic. And that's when I began to understand that First Ladies have a capacity for personifying, if they so choose. And this is a pattern in American women in, in politics, famous or not. There's sort of two things. One is that there are are women, real people, who actually do things. But then there's this also secondary capacity of being a personifying figure, a charismatic figure. And I think many a First Lady has come to becoming First Lady and realizing that this thing was sort of larger than life. Mm -hmm. And that was something Dolly figured out. So she becomes a figurehead for her husband's administration. Now, you know, James is not terribly charismatic. No, he's also <laughs> very short. Very short, but, that's, but he also just didn't have that personifying capacity. And she makes the White House into a symbol, and she um, fosters the attachment to the capital city. And all this is happening in 1808. She doesn't know this. But in 1814, the British are going to burn the capital city. And all of this work that she put into helping the uh, public identify with this house that they called the White House under her term is going to pay off because it's going to give the surge of nationalism around the war. Um, Alita, you've written about all the first ladies uh, for the White House uh, Historical Society. And so picking up from Dolly, did you see them sort of carrying this theme through? Well, and yes, but they made it their own in, mm -hmm. a, in a different way. And I think that, that um, uh, I have to say as an aside that I love Kat, and this is the first time we've ever talked in public together <laughs> instead of shooting emails back and forth and talking on the phone for hours. So, <laughs> I so can't she's promise never you heard me say this. So. <laughs> but I, I think that what you've done to set the, the tone for all of us is really remarkable work. And you haven't gotten enough credit for it. I mean, it really is stunning, Teachers, assigned stunning work. <laughs> but but I, I would say that, um, that if, if I could tweak that a little bit and bring it in broad brush up to today, is that what these women have done have shown amazing courage because they are calm in times when the country is going crazy. I mean, there's just no other word for it. Crazy. Because there's intense eruption in partisan politics right after Dolly. You know, because then we really are breaking into politics, which is a jugular sport, you know, which, which I thought we had gotten rid of, if I may be personal for a moment. Well, but at, but, least, at least we're not shooting each other exactly. now. Exactly. In, in that period, they were. They, yeah, and, <laughs> and I mean, they really were. They were caning each other in the halls of Congress. They were, pulling, they were pulling guns out and shooting at each other. And so if you were looking at um, whether it's um, you know, an, a war with Native Americans or American Indians, whether you're looking at the Civil War, whether you're looking at the war, you know, going counter historically, you know, whether you're looking at um, the War of 1812, or you've got huge economic depressions where the country is literally falling apart and there is no cash. I mean, there's no common currency between states. There's no sense of a union at all. And so what these women do, regardless of the period that they're in, you know, have done what you did so, I don't know the adjective for it. <laughs> Beautifully. You know, I mean, it, it, it's too calm. I mean, what you did was you lifted us up. You know, right. I mean, you did, and and that 
you can't write that in a job description. And you sure can't go into the role expecting that's going to be your job. Right. Nobody told Eleanor Roosevelt she was going to be in a foxhole. Nobody <laughs> told Eleanor Roosevelt she was going to fly an uninsulated military aircraft and spend five weeks on 17 islands in wartime and have her eardrums shattered and go deaf in one ear because she's, you know, she's flying through shooting ballistic, you know, for that time, missiles. I mean, you can't prepare for this. And, and once she did that, the, the generals who had initially been very hesitant to have her do that yeah. saw what a huge difference she made in troop morale, like Martha did. Absolutely. And, um, and said, please come back. Absolutely. And, and they went on record in both the press and in their memoirs saying it was their single biggest miscalculation of the war was to oppose her visit. And so I think you can't train for that. I mean, we can talk about policy, we can talk about politics. But the thing to me that is so remarkable about the women who have assumed this position is how much guts they have, how much brains they have, stamina that is just beyond imagination, and a willingness to rise above it and just do it. You know, there's no time for what my beloved Pat Summit would call a pity party. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, and I think that's it. Uh, Amity, that really sort of gets to, you've got a book coming out on Coolidge, and, and Grace Coolidge was quoted as saying, you just do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, I think that's true about women in general. You know, we, we put one foot in front of the other. But, um, but she, uh, she had not been part of her husband's political life. Uh, he had really excluded her from his political life, and suddenly he becomes vice president, and she is in Washington big time. Yeah, yes, that's right, Koki. And what do you just do when the war is not on the rest of the time of being first lady when there, there's not a crisis? Uh, when I look at Grace and the two people I'll mention who came after her, Mrs. Hoover, uh, and maybe Mrs. Bush as well, uh, you look, what they did, what they did was education very, very often. They turn to that. Uh, so you have someone, in Grace's case, she, she was the first, um, first first lady who graduated from a co-ed state school. She graduated from the University of Vermont, and she actually had this bit of professional uh, trade training to teach the deaf. Uh, so that was incredible. And when she, when she started dating Cal, one of her friends said to her, well, you taught the deaf to hear. Maybe you can teach the mute to speak. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and, and a very, she had a, a marital challenge of an intensely uh, internalized, <laughs> introverted president. But you remember, too, that the deaf and blind in that period were, were not as today. People looked away. Disabilities were negative. It was, hand, you know, it, and she brought them into society. She brought them to the White House. Helen Keller came to the White House. That was a, a, a very important moment for the deaf and blind. That that the first lady would recognize them and integrate them. And she had a great personality, so she was she could draw out anyone. She was the opposite of the president. And she made that her work. She all. Um, I was thinking too of Mrs. Hoover who loved reading and who enabled readers and did enabling of reading all her life. Uh, the Hoover she had been head of the Girl Scouts. She was head of the Girl Scouts, so she's always thinking how to train up, how to lead out. And the, she and, and President Hoover translated um, De Res Metallica from Latin, and I think that <laughs> Lou contributed a lot to that translation, having gone over Hoover's college records. <laughs> I, know, I know this at Stanford. Uh, and she, she brought readers to the White House, and I was just reading a story. When she had, her back was out once, and she had to lie down, and there were some new learners, adult literacy people who had not from the mountains, who had, did not know how to read until adulthood, who came to see her. And she was so sick, but she nonetheless received them upstairs because she knew it was important for them to meet the First Lady, even if the First Lady wasn't doing too well. And she said, what do you read? Here's what I read. Don't read trash. <laughs> read the great works. She was always there. Um, 
uh, with that in the background uh, for President Hoover for these projects and also with scouting. A lot of the presidents did scouting. It's wonderful. And, and I noticed that with Mrs. Bush because I'm a reader too, and when I first saw from the outside just observing the book festival and the literacy project and to have another librarian there, I think the first librarian was Abigail Fillmore, that's right, in, in the White House long ago made a library. She had worked as a school teacher. To, to send that signal in our time is so important, and then the people who read the books or learn the things are better able to handle the emergencies of which we just spoke. Well, that's absolutely right, and, and uh, I think that many first ladies um, have the experience, as you said, Alita, of, of you know, you think you're going to do this, and then life happens, as you had with September 11th, Mrs. Bush. Um, but I, and I want to come back to that um, in a bit, but. But uh, on the theme of, of education, um, even there, it can be something different than you expect. So for instance, with Mrs. Johnson, mm -hmm. um, she was always interested in education. But, but with the Great Society and the War on Poverty and all of that, people started coming forward saying what's really needed here is early childhood education, which of course now we know we need really early childhood education. But so she tried to start Head Start, and it turned out not to be that easy. Yeah. Well, I, this was the one planted question. Because I might she add. told me to come. <laughs> because I love this, and I never get to talk about it. But, um, <laughs> and it, it involves coaches. I, I mother. follow instructions. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when um, Congresswoman Lindy Boggs, or Ambassador Boggs, was kind enough to um, to, enter, to let me interview her, we were talking about um, different policies, and I am passionate about education. And so I, she started telling me the story of how Head Start actually got implemented. The program had been conceptualized. The money had been authorized. But they were coming down to the wire, and they hadn't spent the money yet. And so it was spend the money or lose it. And so what Mrs. Johnson did was call Cokie's mama, and, and they called <laughs> Betty Ford. And the three of them went to Blair House. And they had phones put in in Blair House just for the three of them. And they called every minister and every bus driver that they knew from the campaign trails because they had a week, a week, <laughs> to get the program up and running. And so what they did was they said, okay, we'll use these buses. You know, the churches and different schools will lend us their buses. And that's how Head Start money first got spent and the kids got to the classrooms. And the, there's a point of this. It's ingenuity, it's paying attention, and it's bipartisanship, right, it's and it's friendship focusing on an area of expertise that is good for the country. And it's a model that I think that we can all follow. Yes, Kat, I wanted to get to that, that part about the bipartisanship especially. You know, I had the yes. great honor last summer of, of speaking at Mrs. Ford's funeral, which, she, beautifully. which she asked me to do and then told me what to say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, because she wanted me to talk about the, that time when everybody was together. And, and Dolly Madison did that. She mm -hmm. brought, you know, Thomas Jefferson would only have the Federalists one night and the Republicans another <laughs> night yes. to the White House. But she brought everybody together. And even when they were really in partisan battles, they discovered they couldn't skip her dinners because that's where everything happened. And so they had to show up. Yeah. And I think at this moment, as I'm listening to, to both of you, I'm sort of thinking in, in, in big themes because I'm a professor and there will be a test at the end of this, I'm just going to say that now. And I think to myself, you know, why do we study first ladies? And we don't do it just because it's nice. Mm -hmm. right. And we don't do it just because they're there. But by looking at the work of women, and in this case women who are spouses of presidents, we see things and we pay attention to things that we wouldn't if we just paid attention to the official sphere. Right. Mm -hmm. Legislation, and debates, press releases. So I'm seeing in these stories the idea of psychological politics. So Eleanor Roosevelt is contributing to something called psychological politics, which now we know are maybe the only politics there are. And what, um, what does psychological politics mean? It means how people feel about how they're being ruled. Huh. Mm -hmm. And they feel that way from the messages they get from the leaders. And what these women did is often send these messages about 
how they were ruling about that their families and their husbands were the right ones. For instance, I have to tell you the dirty little secret of American history, and then we'll get back to bipartisanship, <laughs> um, which is that from the beginning, we Americans have had a fascination with aristocracy. Mm -hmm. So, we, yes, we fought an American revolution against a king and against... But that was the only vocabulary of power, royalty, that we knew. So when it came time to legitimize this brand new nation that nobody was sure was even going to really work, uh, they wanted to have that kind of aristocracy. So we had this crazy moment where John Adams is, is arguing to call George Washington my serene highness or something. But in the and end, then, we the called him Mr. President. And the Congress said, we'll call Adams your rotundity. <laughs> <laughs> But in the end, we didn't, thank God. But we also didn't, we don't, we call him Mr. President. But his wife became Lady Washington. And James Madison was Mr. President. And his wife became Queen Dolly. Or the Presidentess. Or the Presidentess. But she answered that need for legitimacy and authority that we needed. And getting back to this idea of bipartisanship. But, but also, yes. but, but let me just, but it was always a tug of war, uh, which I think every first lady has also gone through. You, you have to be elegant enough and, and glamorous enough and all that, not just personally, but as a style of the White House. So people do look up to it and see the sense of royalty, but also down home enough so that you don't alienate people in this Republican small R mm -hmm. society. And Martha Washington knew that. I mean, yes. when she arrived in New York, as much as she loved her satins and silks, mm -hmm. she arrived at the new capital at the time wearing homespun. Well, and she also um, had these lovely white gowns that were supposed to signal the Roman Republic, which is, you know. <laughs> but Dolly Madison did it the other way, I must say. She combined absolutely lavish outfits I'm talking pink satin and ermine and little things that look suspiciously like a crown. <laughs> with uh, <laughs> Tierra. Tierra. <laughs> no, some of it is a crown. Uh, but she had this kind of down home quality and sweetness. And you're using the word bipartisanship, and this is the thing I have to say about Dolly Madison, is there wasn't a word for there wasn't a word for that in, in the early republic. These were people who thought one party should rule and anybody else was a traitor. Unfortunately, there were two groups of people that thought this. <laughs> uh, and they didn't have a sense of working together, which was going to be the hallmark of a democracy with two parties in it. And somehow Dolly Madison understood that the salvation of the system would be to bring people together, make them behave, and let them begin to see each other as um, people of good heart. And Not that caricatures was, of and evil. And that was particularly necessary at the time, um, and we're, we're, we're living it to some degree now, because Washington didn't really exist. Right. And so they were in these boarding houses with people who thought exactly like them. Yes. And so they didn't have the uh, sort of ameliorating uh, discussions with other people who might not be exactly like-minded, except in social settings. Well, you know, Dolly Madison is famous for redecorating the White House. But what she did was really restructure it. And one of the things she did was she created these huge public rooms where everybody, meaning every member of the government, their families, locals, visitors, diplomats, could all gather in one place. And this is amazing. But it's before her squeeze. White House, <laughs> and it was squeezy. But before her White House, you know, there was no place in Washington where everybody could meet, even just all the members of the government. Um, uh, Amity, in, in talking about this, though, you, I, I alluded to Mrs. Bush's situation. Uh, so education was what she thought she was going to be doing, on her way to Capitol Hill to uh, brief the education committee uh, when the first plane hit the trade towers. And, uh, and then life changes, and uh, all of a sudden another set of issues come out, and in this case the women of Afghanistan, the women of the world. It, it, that's right. You you look at the situation and you respond, and you have to turn on a on a dime, don't you? That that's the amazing thing. We we watched uh, Mrs. Bush do this and and identify with President Bush that women were important to democracy in the Middle East. Something that other people picked up later. Uh, one of the things to give us a, a plug at the Bush Institute and the Bush Center, we, we, we have a big emphasis on women in democracy with these groups coming, like the Egyptians who were mentioned earlier. Vis-a-vis, um, -vis, I want to talk a little bit about Grace since I have her on the brain. <laughs> she didn't expect to be the president's wife. 
they, they, their status was pretty low in Washington. They felt when Coolidge was vice president, they were stuck at the Willard. Uh, <laughs> there were she, she, she loved animals. She couldn't have them. In that, the, the Coolidges were like the Theodore Roosevelts. They had menageries when they could, and she only had one animal who happened to be a rodent uh, <laughs> who, who came to eat all the food that all the people came uh, to when she had to receive as vice president. And all of us, and 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 they were already talking about a new vice president for the next term because Coolidge and really worked out when their president Harding died and suddenly she's in the White House. Or wait a minute, she's waiting outside the White House at the Willard for Mrs. Harding to be ready to leave. And to negotiate that when the president before has died and the widow is there and you want to show respect for the widow, they did that beautifully, the Coolidges. And Mrs. Harding wanted to leave one day and then decided not to and they were another week at the Willard, if you can imagine. And they were extremely gracious, as gracious, looking at, at Theodore Roosevelt, how to handle when a president dies and you come in, because, of course, Theodore Roosevelt had that. And then what to do when she's there. And we have her letters to her sorority sisters. And she said, I'm like a babe in the woods or Alice in Wonderland. Pray, pray for me, basically. I'm paraphrasing the last part. And then she rose to it because she understood this was not about her. This was about service. And when you see that it's a role and it's not about you and you play it, uh, uh, that's all, all right. Um, another time we're going to talk about how that clashes perhaps sometimes with your marriage. Should I mention <laughs> the thing we discussed this morning? Go ahead. But, well, well, the Coolidges, as all I imagine uh, first couples, were in individual cones, the cone of the chief executive, the president, and the cone of the first lady. And the um, the, they had a terrible thing happen when they were president, which was their son died. Calvin Coolidge, their son, got a blister on the White House tennis court and died uh, within about eight days. So this was and he was 16 years old. 16 I mean, years old, just before we got antibiotics. Had there been, had it been 20 years or 30 years later, he might have been saved. And, and so I, sudden. I, I was telling Amity, I was doing a panel um, on First Ladies at the New York Historical Society recently, and a man stood up, a somewhat elderly man, and said, because of this death, <laughs> his mother had always told him not to wear dark socks, because it was apparently, he, his mother thought, the dye in the socks that, uh, had, oh. that did in this, this child. So and a whole so, generation yeah. was affected by that. And everyone, how do you mourn in the White House? Right. How do you, and she knew that it was not, she had to mourn for the public. She had to mourn for the president. And in fact, she wore not black, but white in mourning the following year. She, she said, a, she showed how to mourn in the White House. And in that, she became a, a most important symbol because in that period, many, many people lost their children and the mail was extraordinary. And, the, and if you um, read the letters, you know, the papers of Miss Randolph, her secretary, or the letters, you find that nearly every letter that came to the White House upon the death of Calvin began, I too lost mm -hmm. a boy. Mm -hmm. So that unified her with a, a great part of the country. Um, but even given that, the White House uh, chief usher, Ike Hoover, wrote that she, they all called her sunshine. And she, oh, she you was, know. You know, I said before, she was the extrovert to the introvert of the marriage. They and called him smiley. They called him joke. smiley. It was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the president, who, they, both of them were very constrained by mm -hmm. the fact they couldn't mourn as they might if they were not the first couple. And one of her Ways that one way they recovered and demonstrated uh, leadership was they did, they didn't cry in public. They it was just a different conception. They did not go on any television show. They didn't <laughs> talk in that way. She wore white. They got animals. She did many activities with children, both of them. And the story uh, that Koki and I are and she uh, what else did she do for herself? She did exercise. Right. You 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 develop ways. She and she had a Secret Service man who was in her cone with her, Mr. Haley, who had played tennis with her son, so had been there for the tragedy, who had helped to undig a spruce tree from their family lot in Vermont and bring it to the White House to plant on the grounds. And she liked Mr. Haley, and he was important to her in her. And, but President Coolidge was a jealous man. And when they she were... She was a beautiful woman. She was a beautiful <laughs> woman, one of the most beautiful. And it was said she could wear any color. Her complexion was like that. And when they were in South Dakota, she and Mr. Haley went for a walk, and they were an hour late. They got lost. And the president, who always uh, eschewed scandal, 
transferred her Secret Service man away. Mm. And um, he did that because he wanted to avoid scandal. He never let her do things that he thought might bring scandal upon the White House. But that backfired on Calvin because the story was that Calvin was cruel. The, and the, everyone was appalled. Mr. Haley was a very pious man. There was nothing wrong. Uh, Grace wrote a letter to his, his employer to help his career because now the Secret Service man had you know, aspersions. And that was the, the worst snapshot of their marriage. And the best snapshot of their marriage, because it was an extraordinary marriage, um, was that all his important friends came together. There was no presidential library law for, for President Coolidge and said, we will raise money for your papers led by Clarence Barron of the Wall Street Journal, like Barron's. <laughs> and Calvin said, all right, you can raise the money, but let it be for a cause that, that I want it to be for. And they did. They raised $2 million. And I ought to have reckoned for you what that is, but it's about as much as Ambassador Langdale and others have raised for this enormous prize, a large amount of money, prodigious. And President Coolidge took that money and did not really use it for his papers. He gave it to Laura's most that's a, that is a <laughs> gave it to Grace's most important project, which was the Clark School for the Deaf in Northampton, Massachusetts, where she had taught and led, and she where it was so important. So they devoted much of that money to the Clark School, which she and all the years after he knew he might die soon. He had a bad heart. He did die all the years after. Calvin was gone. She had her project, an important educational institution, backed by the friendship of of, of the of the Coolidge's. You know, I'm all not the, sure it the makes amazing sense. story the of a gift. But, <laughs> um, but, well, you know, Alita, um, the um, uh, I was thinking as as Amity was talking, the that business of coming in. Mm -hmm. after a president has died. Now, I, I don't think there was a worse example of that than for Mrs. Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, the, because the, the sense of tragedy, maybe for Mrs. Andrew Johnson, um, uh, but the sense of tragedy in the nation. Um, and um, uh, handling that is not an easy thing to do. And yet? And yet she did it. And I think that, um, and it wasn't, um, the nation just hadn't lost the president. They had lost a first lady that they were fascinated with. Mm -hmm. And um, with the possible exception, of, at least in the modern era, of um, Bess Truman following Eleanor Roosevelt, I don't think there's a bigger contradiction in the public's mind between Jacqueline Kennedy and Lady Bird Johnson. And yet... Um, you know, the country is lucky sometimes. And I think we were exceedingly lucky that, um, that Lady Bird was able to build on Jackie's work but make it her own and expand it in a way that really helped the country. Because what we saw was, you know, we saw the, the gut-wrenching funeral we saw John John's um, saluting. I mean, I, I turned 60 last Tuesday, and I very well remember being pulled out of a, um, a very Republican, very evangelical school for the assassin, you know, to, to be pulled into the hallway to be told that the president had died. And um, as the only Democrat in the school, um, it was, you know, it was, it was hard for me both ways especially in the South, but to see Lady Bird, who understood not how to be a grandmother, but how to be strong and how to comfort and how to lead at the same time, and not just lead in the public, but lead behind the scenes. I mean, if I could switch for a little bit um, and talk about the politics of the office. I mean, what she was so masterful at doing Remember, she's from Texas, okay? I'm from Memphis, so I say Memphis with the same way that I say Texas, okay? But, I mean, we're in the biggest legislative battle of the 60s. And they're going to take the 64 Civil Rights Act, 
which I think never would have passed if John Kennedy hadn't been assassinated and Lyndon Johnson wouldn't have been president. I think that's right. Abs there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, it would have passed eventually. Uh, eventually, yeah. eventually. I mean, but it would be at least, I think, a decade, maybe longer. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what Cokie thinks. But, and, and Lyndon Johnson is knocking heads the way that only Lyndon Johnson can knock heads. But Which Lady, we now can listen to on the tapes. It's so great. Oh, God, it's <laughs> incredible. And, you, and you've got Lady Bird, and Lady Bird is doing the exact same thing with grace and tact. I mean, Lyndon could, you know, do this and, you know, and, and get them by the collars and, you know, and, and have every piece of dirt known to humankind on them to get them to vote the right way, you know. And then you've got Lady Bird reaching out afterwards and sort of calming the feathers, keeping her own tally on how the votes were going at the exact same time that she's knowing how to balance. She's knowing how to do Head Start. She has tremendous relationships across the aisle. I mean, that's something that I think, you know, we don't really realize. I mean, I, um, I mean I've always been struck by the affection, Mrs. Bush, between you and Senator Kennedy. And Eleanor Roosevelt was very close to John Foster Dulles. I mean, the reason that we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is because of Eleanor's relationship with John Foster Dulles. I mean, you never think they were friends. And so what Lady Bird was able to do, I think, is to clearly say to the country without saying it, I am not Jackie. And I miss Jackie, and I mourn for you. But our country is in a crisis. We're in the height of the Cold War. We've just come down from the Cuban Missile Crisis. We've just barely recuperated from the Bay of Pigs. And now we have Birmingham. And how are we going to deal with this? And so she was able to be political and to do policy behind the scenes like Head Start in a way that was non-confrontational, that could help soothe the political uh, feathers that uh, her husband had, in some cases, not just ruffled, but plucked. And, um, sorry, Mark, but he... Um, <laughs> Bess Abel is here, she can attest to it. <laughs> you know, but but I, I, I just, um, I, I think there are times when it's just a fluke. That, that we get lucky. That we get lucky. Well, man, I mean, you know. she knocked well, it out of the ballpark. Well, let's talk about the politics a little bit because yeah. um, you, you know, we talk about Dolly Madison bringing people together and all of that, but of course she was also campaigning for her husband. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah. um, uh, and, you know, making clear that he, he should be the next person elected. And Louisa Catherine Adams, you're, you yes. are now writing about now. She was a complicated person. Yes. But she does talk in her letters. She, after Abigail Adams died, uh, Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife, he was a really impossible person. And um, <laughs> she would write letters to old John Adams, so gossipy letters about what was going on in Washington to, to amuse him, to make, make him happy. And... Um, and so she wrote one letter saying, it is my vocation yes. to get John Quincy Adams elected president. Yes. And, uh, you know, give a sense of how even at the beginning, this was, the, the politics was very much part of what the women were supposed to be doing. Yes, and I have to um, also plug a book that's not mine. <laughs> um, Marjorie Heffron is doing a, has done a beautiful piece of the first half of her life coming out soon. Um, it's interesting when we look at what the women are doing, it, it opens up a sense of what political process, mm -hmm. and that's what I hear both of you saying, that we understand this idea of process. And so um, with Louisa Catherine Adams, it becomes very clear to us that, for instance, John Quincy Adams begins running for president for the election of 1824 as early as 1818. Yes, if you think the last one is bad, or this one is bad, <laughs> 1818, James Monroe was still there. Yes, oh, he, but we knew, so he was going to have two terms, and so everybody was getting ready. Um, so there's this famous thing we read about in our history books, which is the corrupt bargain, yeah. which again will be on the test after this. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's this moment right before the election of 1824 where apparently 
the very um, uptight and upright John Quincy Adams makes a deal with Henry Clay well, to wait, give we, we Clay. Need to explain. Yes. So the election, uh, nobody has a majority in the Electoral College. Right. And it goes to the House of Representatives. And um, uh, Jackson had won the majority of the popular vote. So the assumption was that Jackson would win. And, but it came Jackson, Adams, Clay. And so Clay, being the third, drops out, and it comes down to between... Oh, no, I'm sorry, Clay was the fourth. Ja it was Jackson, Adams, Crawford, Clay. And uh, so Clay, being the bottom man, is out of the running. So, and he's a very powerful member of Congress. So the question is, who's going to get his votes? Right. And so historians <laughs> have been very puzzled by what it seems to be what they thought was a corrupt bargain that somehow John Quincy Adams promised Henry Clay, Secretary of State, in exchange for his vote. And it's puzzled historians. How could this John Quincy Adams, who spends all of his life disavowing any ambition about politics, I will not go show myself to be president, how could he stoop to this kind of well-based politicking? And we don't know the answer to that until we look at what Louisa Catherine Adams is doing. And we understand that from 1818, she institutes a social program every uh, Tuesday night was Mrs. Adams' night, bringing people in to Washington because she figures, as many do, that this election is going to end up in the House. Mm -hmm. And she talks to John, she has a great line where she writes to John Adams, she says, um, Mr. Adams, John Quincy Adams, goes over my calling cards every day as though there was sort of a battle plan. <laughs> And so when we look at what she's doing, then this historical mystery is solved because we understand that in an era when men could not run for political office, they had to be called upon like Cincinnatus from the plow to serve the public, it was their wives who acted as campaign managers. And, and so what happens is we get to the House of Representatives, Adams wins on the first ballot, which just flabbergasted everyone, and they assume it's this deal with Clay. But the truth is all of those men had been entertained by Louisa Catherine Adams. And in fact, one of them uh, went back to his boarding house where he had promised his messmates uh, that he would not uh, vote for Adams on the first ballot, and they won't let him sit down to dinner because they're very mature. And um, he... <laughs> and, uh, and he... <laughs> And he um, and and they write. Uh, one of them writes to uh, his wife. Everyone says his wife made him do it, and his wife was a Schuyler. His yes. wife was uh, was Eliza yes. Hamilton's do, sister. Do you know what Louisa <laughs> did too? Is she instituted something interesting? The subscription system. So this is a town where allegiance and attendance are equal. So what she did was she would hold these parties every Tuesday night, but you would be invited for the season. So you would accept her invitation for every single Tuesday night. Now you didn't have to go every night, but you better not show up anywhere else at anybody else's party. And in that way she acted almost as a whip to garner. Right. Yes. And she had the big ball for Jackson hoping it yes. might you know, send him back to Tennessee. But, and, it, um, and it did. <laughs> I, I want to get to you in a minute, Amity, but Alita, just because we're right on this moment. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, of all people, uh, didn't want to go to the convention in uh, 1940 because he too wanted to be drafted and named by acclamation. And of course, this was breaking the precedent. It was a third term. So he sent Eleanor. Well, what happens is, is that it's pretty, they're pretty confident that, in fact, FDR is going to be drafted for the unprecedented third term. Um, if I can say this on C-SPAN, when all hell breaks loose <laughs> is with the vice presidential nomination. And that's when the coalition completely unravels. And um, the field team of the convention are frantically um, calling the president. And the president says, well, if I can't have Wallace, I'm not going to run. And he's, you know, he's already written, he's sitting there at a card table writing out what he's going to say when he's going to reject the nomination. And so they call Eleanor, who's at Valkyll, which is her um, small cottage on the Roosevelt estate, and she flies to the convention. And with no prepared speech, no speech writer, no nothing, walks into the convention, and it's absolutely pandemonium. You know, it, it makes today's conventions just look like everybody's you know, falling asleep on cough syrup. Well, they are. You know, <laughs> they are. 
you know, but I mean, you know, they're floor fights. They, you know, they're not choreographed for TV. You know, there are no huge aisles unless you're running over singing a song and trying to run over the person in front of you with the banner. And so there's, it's such pandemonium that the people that are with her want to pull her back off the podium. And, you know, she says no. And so she goes up, and in the shortest speech in the history of either the Democratic or Republican convention, says this is no ordinary time, as Doris Kearns Goodwin has, has so well created. But, and that really calms, calms the convention down. And it's, it's out of respect for the president, but it's also out of respect for her. Because if I could just tweak one more thing, and I'll say it fast, I'm watching the clock. <laughs> but in 1928, when Al Smith, the governor of New York, is the first Catholic to seek the nomination, and the party bosses have come to, e come to FDR and leaned on him heavily, heavily, to run for governor, which he is not really expecting to do for another couple of years. Remember that, you know, that the nation still very much knows that this man is not only battled polio, but that he cannot stand unassisted, and that, in fact, you know, he has these 10 pounds of steel on his legs. What Eleanor Roosevelt did, and if I may inject, to say, please, before Lucy, if you remember one thing, remember that Eleanor was political before Lucy. That is the first question <laughs> on the Lucy Mercer, you're talking about. Lucy Mercer. Right. Okay. But what Eleanor did was help work with the women of New York State to build a grassroots campaign system, which totally restructured the politics of New York. If I knock on your door, Mrs. Bush, and you say, well, I have questions about farm parity, okay, I'm dutifully going to write down on my card if I can't answer it. Then I'm going to come back with an answer, and I'm going to knock on your door again. And if you give me another question that I can't answer, I'm going to write it down on the card. They had note card systems for voters in upstate New York that were visited five times. I'm not talking robocalls. <laughs> I'm talking, you know, respectful one-on-one, -on -one, what do you care about? And that says to um, Al Smith to say to his key aide, we must have FDR on the ballot in 28 because his wife is more well-known among the party faithful and upstate voters than anybody in the history of the state. Mm. So that they understand you know, what they have to do, but they understand why they want to do it, and they understand why it's important in a way that advances their husband's careers. I mean, the, the sense of, of the being in the public, the public person. Uh, you know, I, I was struck in reading about Grace Coolidge that Will Rogers uh, loved her, and, which says a lot, and, <laughs> and called her... Public woman number one, or public female, female public number female number one. Talk about that a little bit. Always about helping. Always about putting herself second at great at great cost. So that's a little bit different. And I'm thinking here about politics. Mrs. Adams, Mrs. Roosevelt, planning the next campaign. Grace removed herself from that, and Calvin kept her removed too, to the extent that. Um, she, she, she absolutely wanted to make it clear she didn't know what he was planning ahead about running for that extra term in 1928. It, Calvin Coolidge was enormously popular, so he could have run for another term in 28. And we know that Grace prob knew he wouldn't. Um, you know, she, made a, she made a blanket in the White House that had a square for each month left, and there weren't that many squares <laughs> on it. Uh, and, and that was on the Lincoln bed. Uh, but she, she was at pains not to show that she was calling the shots or that she knew. And when the president said, I do not choose to run, a big surprise in the summer of 1927, uh, a senator was over for lunch, and she said uh, the equivalent of knock me over with a feather. <laughs> she really wanted to leave the executive uh, to be free, and that was a formal, sort of almost a kabuki dance for her. And she, she uh, if you look at her writings, and she wrote a lot, she wrote a beautiful autobiography, she said um, there was another mother she was thinking of, and that mother was the mother of Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> 
Mm. Who, there was someone whose boy was doing something truly dangerous in those days, and Mrs. Lindbergh never wanted to freak out her son. Uh, Grace felt that way about Calvin. She wanted to help but not get in the way. It's not a modern style. It's not what we would do, um, but she did it well, and for that we admire her. And there are people who admire Calvin Coolidge very much for deciding, like Cincinnatus or Washington, that maybe uh, it was helpful for the country to have a change in leadership after a time, that this idea, and we deal with it today, of going back and going back because we are an important leader. Coolidge didn't like that. He thought, rather, let the country do without one, and she supported him in that. So a, a, a first lady who supported another style of presidency. But she also, as I think every first lady uh, has felt, this sense of tremendous duty and she said oh, at yes, one so point, right. this was I and yet not I. This was the wife of the President of the United States, and she took precedence over me. And in that, she was similar to Eleanor, who said something like that, and you go all the way back. You are playing a role, and it is hard, uh, and we, but it's a value to the people, the presidency, the, uh, the first couple as symbol. And, and, and when, uh, when, uh, when they were out of the White House, she wrote poetry about her son, which was eventually published. She wrote a book, and they were both very much happier. They were out of the prison, at least to some extent. They were to happier together, but during the period she, they, they, it is not I, but not I. I am playing a role, and it's incredible, it's wonderful great work. Great illustration of this idea of the real woman and the charismatic figure. Right. This doubleness, yeah. But, you know, but Martha Washington, even after <laughs> George is out of the presidency and even after he dies, yes. everybody still keeps coming to Mount Vernon, right? And right. she has to entertain them all, including Thomas Jefferson, about whom she said terrible things in private. <laughs> yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah. um, and when one of the emissaries from Adams comes to her and says, we want to bury George Washington at the Capitol. Yeah. She says, I don't want to do that, but I am so accustomed to putting my duty ahead of my personal desires that, of course, I will do it. Now, it ended up she didn't have to do it, but, 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 yes. but I mean, you think that's just, that goes with the territory? Yes, I do. And, and actually, Alita's now reminded me we have a clock to watch. And I was wondering if you would let me say something a little bit again about why we study First Ladies. But can I just say one thing yes. about right. Judy Fast? <laughs> I got well, you. You really do have a talk to us. Fair. But, um, <laughs> I mean, Eleanor carried a prayer in her wallet that I think really encapsulate this. And that is, dear Lord, lest I continue in my complacent way, help me to remember that somewhere someone died for me today. Mm. And if there be war, help me to remember to ask and to answer am I worth dying for? And I think that That's sort of encapsulates mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. concept. All right, you have 40, 40 seconds. So here it goes. <laughs> so what have our first ladies given us? From Martha Washington through Mrs. Laura Bush all the way to the present, they've given us an alternative model for politics, one that centers on civility, that builds bridges instead of bunkers, and we can draw on that model of politics. So just when we despair, <laughs> of the whole thing with the fighting and we can look to this model and be assured that it was present right from the first. And love our country enough to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say a final word there too, Amity? So. In different ways. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all so very, very much. Thank this you. was delightful. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bush. Thank you for having us. Shall we? Good. 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 Good.